It's getting live on Facebook. What's up everyone? Jeremy Majors here with Majors Academy Dog Training out of Green Bay, Wisconsin. You already know this is episode 111 of Dog Behavior Q&A where anybody watching can ask any question you like about dog behavior. Remember that your question will, could uh, help out someone who could be going through the same or similar issues. So don't be shy. Ask your question and we'll give it our best shot to answer any and all questions. Shout outs to Lucky Seven Rescue out of Green Bay, Wisconsin. Just did a seminar for them this past weekend and uh, it's fine. And um, it was awesome. I love the chance to uh, get in front of people, um, welcome their questions, and try again solve problems. The good thing about um, you know putting on these seminars is, especially for these rescues, is I get a chance to educate the foster parents who may be uh, facing dogs that uh, have a you know a, a, a I don't want to say questionable, but a past that you know is a little shaky. And so uh, one of the things that I like to focus on when it comes to um, when it comes to uh, uh, bringing in new dogs is sort of what to do and how to make that smooth transition for the dog who is, you know, maybe coming from who, who where, wherever, you know, who knows. And so uh, I think my focus on is with those seminars is trying to, uh, you know, um, trying to give them some tools in order to, uh, like I said, make the smooth transition because you don't know the, do you know, foster parents when you first bring in a dog, you don't know them, they don't know you. And things can go south, you know, uh, with, with your resident dogs or uh, with you. And so it's very important to know sort of protocols uh, and things like that to learn in order to make that smooth sand transition because that's what I do. I bring in dogs that don't know me, that do have a shaky past and or a shaky present. And um, I have to get along with them, I have to gain their trust, and then I have to guide them. Um, and I have to uh, be able to get them to, again, trust me so I can put them, <clears throat> walk them through uh, some stressful situations and teach them how to deal with stress. And so, um, one of the things that I, what we talk about every single time is, again, what what I feel is most important to provide the dog that you don't know. Um, and that is not, uh, unfortunately, that is not a bunch of treats, toys, and affection. It's, uh, it's not that. Some dogs, while they will enjoy it, it's not something that's going to get them over their fear. It's not something that's going to make that smooth transition. Because whether or not the dog is fearful, aggressive, I know people want to maybe label me, and maybe I label myself, but people want to label me as just a dog trainer that uh, just does aggressive dogs and fearful dogs and all that. But it's not that way at all. Um, and every dog, no matter if they're aggressive or not, will benefit from uh, structure anyway. So I want to stress to people that the structure is more important. The respect is mo more important. Uh, for your other dogs, for maybe your kids, for maybe your, your the people who come in, in and out of your house and everything, the dog needs to learn how to respect certain things first. Um, and uh, and that's what I show people. So these seminars are very, you know, they're, you know, if you have a rescue and you know a rescue that would be interested, the seminars are free. I don't charge for these seminars. Um, you can take, put that money back towards the rescue or something like that, but I don't get a dime. I want to make sure uh, that people have the most opportunity to get dog education uh, and not have to spend a whole lot of money to get access to some uh, someone with some, with some experience. So, okay, we're getting some questions rolling in here. Let's let's have a conversation. All right, I have an eight-month-old female English Springer Spaniel who has been getting into fights with my two-year-old Labradoodle. 
Um, she is extremely possessive of space, food, toys, and this has been escalating since she was 12 weeks old when we initially saw how possessive she was over a piece of food. He fights uh, happen in a split second. The fights happen in a, in a split second, and I don't see any signs so that I can intervene. So I now have the female bringer tethered to me to control her space and resources. All right, great question. Um, so I'll go ahead and tell you right away that uh, for a dog to be that young and be that possessive, um, first and foremost, uh, here's things to look forward to. I always tell people this, is it's not the best thing to hear, but I do think it's necessary to hear. Um, if you did, in fact, get this dog from a beard, um, you you want to, um, we want to, as a society, in my opinion, want to be more tough on breeders who are breeding dogs that are naturally going to be aggressive. That dog, you know, you know, I don't think the breeder took into account that maybe, um, you know, those traits shouldn't be passed on because now you have, now you're giving these, these dogs to a family that, um, wants a companion dog and um, uh, doesn't necessarily want to have to work through these issues. Um, and so um, and so when you go pick out your dog anytime or anyone who wants to go pick out a dog, make sure um, you know you have maybe a checklist of things that you can go through in order to not start with a problem because people shouldn't have to deal with that when you get a puppy. They just shouldn't. Um, kind of go off topic here just a little bit. There was a video in a balanced dog training group that this um, Rottweiler was probably, I mean, probably around 12 weeks. Dog was very small, but resource guarding like you wouldn't believe. Um, the owner was petting the dog and, uh, and even the cameraman, the dog was like looking at the camera and then, you know, growling and just face over the bowl, you know, at 12 weeks old, you know, that's just ridiculous. It only speaks of, you know, the, in my opinion, we gotta, we gotta be tougher on these breeders for breeding dogs like that. Who the hell wants to deal with a dog that's going to become a hundred plus pounds and you got to deal with stuff like that from the get go. Uh, you know, I don't think we should even put responsibility, you know, everyone on that, on that video, was commenting on the video, um, scrutinizing the owner. Okay, yeah, well, it's not very much so public knowledge that you shouldn't be able to pet your dog while feeding. Um, but it's not something you should be doing. Okay, but at the same time, no dog should be acting that crazy while you're doing that. That dog was just super intense, and Rottweilers are obviously known for that. Um, and so, coming back full circle, before I answer your question, I'm sorry this is taking so long, but... Um, we got to be tougher on breeders. That's how we're going to be able to keep dogs from going to the rescue or um, um, going to the humane society or shelters and stuff like that. So if you have, if you, you know, if you have had this dog and make sure that the breeder knows that, you know, hey, you know, this is not something that, sh that is conducive to a uh, companion dog at all. All right. So that being said, all right. Let's let's uh, answer your question quick. And I'm sorry I went off on a tangent about that, but uh, I do think it's very important to to know and hear and just start a discussion because um uh there wouldn't be any too many there wouldn't be all these shelter shelter dogs. You, you know, again, we do have to give people the benefit of the doubt. It's not always the people who buy those dogs' fault. It's not, you know, and um. We as a society put all the pressure, or even dog trainers, put all the pressure on the people who buy these dogs and not enough pressure on the breeders who are breeding these aggressive dogs. And so not people aren't, I don't think people should be equipped to have to deal and or even learn with aggression. It's a lot. It's stressful. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's that. All right. So basically your English Springer Spaniel has to learn how to respect what you guys the owners uh, have to say about certain things, okay? The goal is to get our dogs to have a, a strong enough dialogue to where the dog actually listens to your words. So you can 
um, you can intervene. And I'll show you some, or I'll, I'll, I'll tell you right away some signs to look for. Body stiffness. Okay. When a dog is resource aggressive and they're, and they're getting ready to, um, or they're, they're in within the resource aggression or getting ready to fight or whatever, um, here's what you should look for. First of all, if there's any dog that comes near the dog that is aggressive, then that's your first sign that you want to be aware of right away. Because you know potentially that that dog could become resource aggressive. So watch the other dog, you know. And then as the dog gets closer, watch the dog that's, that's watch your Springer Spaniel and watch for stiffness. The dog's going to have to be, uh, you know, sort of tense before it decides to lunge. And again, watch the eyes. Um, just watch the overall body language. Um, watch the head. The head will start to get down closer to the resource. And, and then they'll maybe, you know, look like this. But, um, you know, so toys here. Your English Springer Spaniel's head's here. Dog comes close. The, the, the Springer Spaniel probably will do this. And then lunge. And then lunge. So those are the signs. Okay, watch that body language. Now, again, you, wanna, you want your dogs... So you may have to take the toys up for a while, but you want the dog to be able to respect when you say, hey, no, right? Because if you could do that, then the problem wouldn't even be there. So that's the goal. You have to get your dog to respect your word um, uh, better. All right. And how you do that is kind of tough to tell you uh, right off the top. There's a couple of ways. You will need something that the dog would want to avoid. Um, and uh, and so it could be the form of, you know, I mean, we can go as low if your dog is sensitive. I'm pretty sure it's not. But we can start with water bottles, doggy don'ts. Um, that's a good tool. E-collars, something like that. Um, although e-collars is very tricky. I shouldn't really promote um, just the use of that without training. Sometimes, um, sometimes things could go really wrong if you aren't using a professional. So I would maybe... Uh, check out to see if you can get more advice from a um, from a professional because those are those are some deep rooted uh, aggression and, and again it's something that I in my opinion comes from you know genetics because the dog has been doing it since twelve weeks like um, uh, and so uh, it, it could get a little tricky but I hope that answers your question so it's like it's not I can't give you a definitive answer because I don't know the dog. And I don't know how sensitive they are. Um, and if I once got to know them a little bit better, then maybe I can give you more of an answer. But, but, uh, but uh, check out my YouTube videos. There are many different videos on how to help with that situation. All right. Thanks for your question. Feel free to ask another. Okay, they're rolling in now. It's Wednesday. It's hump day. All right, I have a... One and a half year old Wiesler that is occasionally showing aggression when he is stopped from doing something and he has bitten. Uh, all right. Well, here's the deal. When it comes to biting, dog, the dog is going to make a choice whether it's worth it for them to bite. But they can also not make a choice if they don't think it's worth it for them to bite. So, uh, ultimately, you have to punish that dog um, to the point where the dog says, all right, I don't want to do that again. Because there's nothing more organic than uh, that situation when it comes to dog-to-dog -dog education. Dogs have no problem educating other dogs the way that they do it. Um, and so, again, you will have to punish that dog somehow um, and to get the dog to realize that that's not a good choice because it is a lack of respect. It's like a child slapping their 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 parent uh, because the child says, hmm, there's nothing going to happen to me for it. I want what I want. And if you try and intervene, then I'm going to bite you or I'm going to slap you. That's the attitude of your dog. So it's pure coming from a pure place of attitude brattiness. And and so, in general, you can help with that situation on an overall scale by being tougher on the dog in all other ways. Go through a checklist. Is the dog allowed to jump? 
Is the dog allowed to? Is the, does the dog bark all the time? Does the dog is the dog allowed on the furniture? Is does the dog uh, uh, is allowed to do? Just try and think about how much choice that dog gets to assume it can have, or how much freedom the dog uh, assumes it can have, and then you want to um, start eliminating those things because the more the areas where the dog, um, the more areas where the dog has to listen the more easier it is for them to listen where and when it really matters, uh, like you're stopping them from doing something. So pure brat sounds like, um, and you will have to uh, sort of, you know, have an intervention with that um, bratty Vizsla of yours. All right. Thanks for your question. Feel free to ask another. April says, hey, if we can't board our dog, what's your opinion on being able to take vacations with out bringing your crazy dog. We only have one person that can watch Zeke and feel like we can't leave and take a family vacay because we're ruled by these crazy dogs and you're not in Atlanta anymore, so that's that. Uh, yeah, I would hire someone who can handle that dog. Um, um, I, myself, uh, have someone who comes and watches my dog because they're not easy dogs. And so um, that could be your best bet. Um, I can also recommend a couple of good trainers that I personally know, and you can talk with them and see how you feel with them. But, um, you know, my, my opinion would be to, um, hire someone to come to your house, educate the heck out of them on how to deal with your dogs. And then, um, then things become easier and easier as, um, your dog gets to know them and they get to know your dog. Um, and so, you know, uh, maybe start with a dog walker who also does house sitting. You know what I'm saying? Um, but also just make sure you're uh, telling them, you know, how to control the dog. And the best way, since he's e-collar trained, is to um, have your tools ready and, um, and allow the person to, con to learn how to, you know, do those certain things that, that will get respect from Zeke to that new person. We can talk more about it if you want. Um, feel free to reach out. All right, thanks for your question. Okay, Jessica says, have you ever had a situation where a dog has regressed after your training? Like, can they have such a, such bad separation anxiety from being away from their family where they just shut down and refuse to do anything for you? Um, okay. Let me read that, reread that. Um, have you ever had a situation where a dog has regressed after your training? Like they can have such bad separation anxiety from being away from their family where they just shut down and refuse to do anything for you. Uh, I, okay, so I, there's definitely situations after my training that, that, um, that I have to address and readdress and coach. That's what's, that's just a part of the, the program. And I try and make it as easy for my clients for me to, to, to reach out to me. Um, I thank them for reaching out to me just to keep them on the right track. So if we can sort of stay in contact with each other, then I really, really, really believe we can um, get much better in any, uh, in any issue. The, the deal is, you know, we, it's a continued education after I sort of put some sort of foundation on the dog. And three weeks is long, you know, it's, I could ask for more time and really get a, set a good foundation, but some people just, you know, three weeks is too long for them, or, you know, and so anything more than that is also, you know, kind of hard to ask. Um, but if your dog is shutting down and refusing to do anything, then, you know, that's sort of also can be coached out of the, out of the dog as well. Um, it really can. If a dog is refusing to do something, it's still trying to, you know, manipulate the situation, in my opinion, to the dog's favor. You know, and so you really got to learn about separation anxiety and how to combat that. Um, because, uh, you know, you could really be feeding into it. If the dog shuts down and you allow the dog to shut down, and you don't know how to coach them through that, that could be feeding into the separation anxiety. So that's what I'll say. That's a quick little answer, but um, 
But yes, I do believe that, um, you know, we can continue to move up and forward and better um, with my training if um, we stay in contact with each other post-training. All right. Great topic. Friends of the Forlorn misses you in, in, in the ATL. I miss you guys, too. And Tobias is still around, and he's still doing awesome, and he's like the best social dog ever. I never knew he'd be that dog, but he really gets into every single dog and makes every single dog feel very, very safe. So, it's awesome. All right, next question. Okay, Megan Lewis says, how do you stop a dog from growling and going crazy when he sees another dog from across the street? Uh, let me ask you this, Megan, and I'll come back to you once you answered it. So let me ask you this. Is it in the house or is it on walks? Because I give you an answer. I can give you both answers right now, but let's just be more specific so that because we got these questions rolling in. All right. You're very welcome, April. All right, next question. Uh, okay, this is who I was talking about. Check out his page, his hands-on with every dog that comes through with his facility. Oh, thank you for that. I appreciate that. It's more of a recommendation. Happy th Thursday. Sarah, it's Wednesday, by the way. Not Thursday. I usually, I used to have my shows on Thursday, but now it's Wednesday. All right, let's answer some questions on the other social media stuff. Okay. Jumping when people come over. Place them in. Yeah, someone answered it for you. And people, when you have, a, if you have a dog that's jumping when people come over, the dog has got to be told what to do in that moment. And you can help the dog out by telling the dog what to do when people aren't over. You know, as in, it will help the dog listen a little easier. Uh, so, yeah, someone answered that for you. Okay. Next question. Do you ever use muzzle in conjunction with training while working on human slash fear, human fear slash aggression as a temporary added protection for when the dog is meeting slash greeting new people? Uh, I don't personally use muzzle. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm not in favor of them, though. I, I would use them in very specific things like getting a dog used to nail trimming and or being touched or collars and stuff like that, maybe. Um, but I don't use muscles because there's, the difference between me and a lot of trainers is a lot of trainers don't, they'll have other staff members that spend time with the dog. So the dog could have, get to know three or four different trainers, which in its own right is, is beneficial. So I'm not going to, I'm not, not knocking them for that uh, line of thought, but when I bring dogs in, I'm the only person that works with the dog. And so the relationship that I build with the dog is one of which it, I don't find it necessary for muzzles. And I don't get bit. So there's the, your proof. I don't use muzzles. If I got bit with my approach, then I would probably use muzzles more. But So I don't use muzzles um, because I work with the dog. I mean, I, have, I, I establish a pretty good relationship with the dog. Um, but to answer your question a little further, temporary added protection for when the dog is slash meeting and greeting new people. If the dog needs a muzzle while meeting and greeting new people, in my opinion, the dog should not be meeting or greeting new people. Not ready for that yet. The dog should still be learning how to listen to you better because that's more, more important. The muzzle is and can be something that throws off or withholds or delays learning because it's a factor that they have to get over in this already stressful situation. Um, and so you have to work through the muzzle conditioning part. You know what I'm saying? 
it's a factor that could cause frustration. Um, again, not saying that it's not effective. So I am in favor for it. Is I'm talking on a personal ex in a, on, on a personal level. Um, I don't need them because again, I'm having my dogs listen to me very well, and I'm having the people that I'm introducing the dog to listen to me very well. So I'm controlling the environment for the dog so that the dog doesn't need to bite. And once you learn really good body language, then you're, 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 you're more likely to let that aggressive dog go up to them. But that's the key. I let my dogs that I'm working with go up to people when they're ready and not not but after a certain uh, 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 amount of time of control after that yeah that's that muzzles are good okay okay next question our rescue molly has noise phobia i was hoping that with consistent obedience training give her another job this would be better today our seven-year-old son was playing with his light slash saber sword thing, even though he wasn't near her and wasn't aiming it at her. She completely shut down. I'm trying to act as if nothing is wrong and feeding and not feeding into her insecurity. She is still, even after I may have put it away, hiding in the bathroom. Should I allow her to hide out in there, even though? He put his toy away or make her go to her bed in the living room so she can see there's nothing to be afraid of. It's a, It's been a good hour of her acting scared, walking around the house with her ears back and her tails tucked. Wow, that's some strong, that's some strong, uh, that's some strong fear for sure. Um, but I would, I'd put the dog in place. And then, um, See if you can work through it. Um, you know, it, it it does matter how close you get with the anything that the dog is scared of. Maybe give it a little bit more space, um, but only give it a certain amount of time too. Ten minutes is plenty of long enough time to give her some time on that place with things going on, and then let her hide in the bathroom. I don't care. You know, but as long as there is a certain amount of time where the dog is, you know, doing what you tell the dog to do, then you'll start to see the dog will get better. It may take some time for this dog, but don't allow the dog to completely remove herself from the situation and and really divulge into those insecurities. So um, give a certain amount of time with the dog uh, on this bed while the world goes on around her. That's Thanks for your question. Okay, the eight-month-old Springer Spaniel I asked about earlier was social was at socialization class at ten weeks old and has been through basic obedience class and I'm starting e-collar training with her. Obedience, why she is great, but it's her reactive possessiveness that I'm having trouble dealing with. She also has separation anxiety, which we have been dealing with since we brought her home at eight weeks. I don't think this is a case of bad breeding. But at this point, it is just a lesson learned. Any advice for the separation anxiety issues we are ha also having? I do have a balanced trainer coming to our home to evaluate Friday. Okay, uh, well that's good. It, 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 socialization has nothing to do with how the dog is gonna act at home. Well, a little to do. So the dog can get along with other dogs because it has no reason to, to be a brat over there and the other dogs and stuff like that. Um, the problem is, again, I'm gonna reemphasize that the dog needs to listen to you, you and your commands. If the obedience isn't working, then you will have to try and learn other other ways. So that's good that you're having a balanced trainer come to your home, but um, separation anxiety, uh, you know, I could go on and on about that. So I'll give you some quick answers. And I also have a YouTube video and uh, YouTube videos on separation anxiety. But the biggest deal is this. When you come home, the dog should not be the priority. In fact, you should give that dog a job to do when you come home. If it's in the crate, tell the dog to lay down in the crate, walk away until you hear, don't hear um, the dog at all. And 
you really want to be able to walk into your house and you don't hear or see the dogs necessarily. If you're saying hi while they are um, excited, anxious, whatever it may be, then you're feeding into the separation anxiety. Um, so that's, I think, is one of the biggest things. And then properly teaching the dog how to become calm before to get what it wants is an, another big factor, no matter uh, what it is. Like the dog should be able to sit down and look at you, not you asking for the eye contact, but it actually given to you on its own before going through a door or before letting out of a crate. All right, that's how you're going to fight separation anxiety because you're teaching the dog that calmness gets you what you want and nothing else. And so um, sometimes those things take time to really be able to settle their mind in, but the dog should not be um, allowed to uh, get what it wants in a, in a nothing but, in anything but calm mindset. And that's how you combat separation anxiety. Do not make it a big deal that you've been gone. So don't really make her, make her more excited when you come home. And don't make it a big deal when you leave. All right. Good luck with that trainer. I hope they, they can help you out. And thank you for your question. Okay, dokie. Um, what do you recommend for dog food? And what... Uh oh, where'd it go? And what should we be looking for in a good quality food? It seems there are so many choices nowadays. Uh, I don't know. Uh, as long as there's not any, um, someone on here could probably answer this better than me. But as long as there's not any byproducts in the food, um, you know, then there's maybe plenty of food that could help, that could work with your dog. Um, but your dog tells you also what's best for him by the, what their stool looks like, what their skin looks like, what their teeth look like. Um, and so there's, it kind of depends on what the dog, you know, how their system responds to it. Um, but I would say by anything that says byproducts, so you'll have chicken byproducts and stuff like that. Those you definitely want to stay away from. All right. Thanks for your question. Hope Sammy doing all right. She's an extreme case with her fear. That is, that does definitely sound extreme. Wait a minute. Is that the dog I came, I came and saw? That dog has strength, extreme, oh, didn't, didn't couldn't, uh, couldn't tell by when I met her. All right. In addition to leash aggression question above, do you always crate dogs when you leave them alone? Um... No, I don't always crate dogs when I leave them alone. Did you ask a question that I didn't answer? Let me see. Oh, I'm sure this is a rookie question, but leash aggression. I have two Beejlas. What's up with all these Beejlas? I'm training three of them right now. What's going on here? All right, I have two Beejlas, and they are wonderful off-leash, but lots of humans are uncomfortable with off-leash dogs. So I leash when approaching other dogs and my older dog is just pissy with it. Uh, okay, so leash regression is, is, is another really broad topic I could go into details with, but I will just keep it simple. When it comes to leash regression, you must get the dog to heel, loose leash by your side. Because when you do that, you're taking control of their mindset uh, and you're kind of showing them that no matter what's going on, you must stay by my side. And then when you facilitate that consistency, the, dog, then the dogs will make better choices because they'll see a dog, they'll try and pull, which again is against the rules at all times, and then you'll pull them back and they'll make a good choice to stay by your side as opposed to lash out at those other dogs. So that's leash aggression uh, in a nutshell. You have to sort of say, this, this is what you're doing. This is a safe area. And there's no need for any of that bull crap to go on. And if you don't, you know, um, then we have to give you a correction. 
appropriate enough to get you to continue to heal uh, by your by my side. Cheers, B. All right, thanks for your question. In addition to the least aggressive uh, question above, do you always, do you recommend always crating dogs when leaving them alone? No, um, it just, that depends on how they're doing at home or in the house. If they're doing good at home and they don't chew up stuff, they don't bark out the window constantly, they don't pee and poop in the house and they're relaxed in the house, then I, I wouldn't care about crating them. If you're talking about my training dogs, of course, they are crated for their safety. Um, so, that's that. All right, next question. Um, you guys also feel free to ask as many questions as you like. This isn't a one question thing, all right? Just, but just so you know. Okay, what is the best training to start? What is best training to start? Um, well, I'd say training starts when you bring your dog home because you're going to teach the dog how to uh, be respectful of certain things. So training is, training starts when you bring the dog home and uh, because you're actually, you know, again, creating what the dog thinks is okay to do and what the dog thinks is not okay to do. If you don't train your dog at all when they come home, then they're going to piss all over your your house because well they haven't been trained otherwise all right thanks for your question okay do you have puppy training videos uh no yes i don't know i have a lot of videos um i do have some puppy training videos i do think now that i think about it but puppy training isn't that much different from adult training it is and it isn't uh, there are certain limitations puppies can, you know, puppies will meet or um, they can't, they can't learn for, a, you know, at the level of uh, an adult dog. But for the most part, the principles are the same that I teach every single dog. Um, obviously, I'm going to be a lot more patient, lenient, things like that with puppies. All right. Thanks for your question. What do you think about American band dog? I have no idea what kind of dog that is. Uh, my boy Kane Corso got into a fight with my boy American Bully. How do I end the beef? Them, them, the dogs have to respect you more, man. Uh, and the best way to best way to again see get dogs to see eye to eye is to be able to get them to listen to you in all in any situation if they're listening to you at a very high level they will they'll even stop fighting if they have that certain level of um ability to listen to you i've done it many times many times um in my early days in my dog daycare days dogs would get into fights and all i would have to say is hey or you know, just be present. And because they respected my word so much, they stopped fighting. Can you imagine that? Because there's so many people that, um, there's so many people that, uh, you know, when fights happen, dogs don't give a crap about their owners. And they actually get bit. And those are all choices that the dogs make. And they're all bad. And they're all because of a lack of respect. So I don't want you guys to think that fighting is, something that is impossible to get your dogs to stop from doing. Um, obviously, you want to take more preventative measures in the beginning anyway. You know, it's not like you say, all right, let's see if we can let them fight and then I can stop it. Like, that's not a good goal. The good goal, the better goal, is to get them to respect your word before they fight. If, that, if I have two dogs and they look at each other and I feel that they're, they're, they're thinking is... Um, ill-intentioned, then I'm going to stop that right away. I'm going to intervene right away. That's the best way you can help dogs get comfortable with each other. Because when you have two dogs that are in the same family that are fighting, 
their relationship is damaged now. They're insecure with each other, and fighting could happen more and more and more. All right. Thanks for your question, man. Feel free to ask another one. Okay. Yes, Remy's sister. I didn't see that, but wow, that's crazy. I love the separation anxiety info for Michelle. You talked about being in a crate. We have a pup in the crate and leave our three-year-old room. How would you deal with that? Just walk by and ignore them till they lay down. Um, yes, you could try that approach. That is one approach you may be, may be waiting for a while, depending on the temperament of your dog. Uh, what works for me is a little bit of both. Sometimes I wait the dog out. Sometimes I give the dog a job to do. Sometimes I'll walk right over to them and I'll say, lay down or sit. And then once they sit, count to five and then walk away. Pretty important to count to five. Um, because if you just sit and walk away, they'll just stand right back up. But you want to let them settle in that sit. So tell them to sit, count to five, and then walk away. Um, also, very important to kind of know when you are teaching your dog to be calm in the crate is never to uh, uh, baby talk or, or talk to them or get them excited in any way in the crate. The crate should be a place of relaxation. The best way to facilitate relaxation is to sort of be just authoritative with your talk in the crate to help realize that the dog must be uh, listen and must be calm before it gets what it wants, which is out of the crate or your attention. And so teach the dog to be calm before you give them what they want. All right. Basically, where do we start so she learns to listen to us right away? Uh, let's see. What would be some good training tools for a 10-month-old pit? Um, I would say get the walk right. Um, crate train the dog to where the dog is very calm and quiet in the crate while you're home. Spend time. That's the other thing about that separation anxiety is put the dog in the crate while you're home so you can teach the dog to be calm in the crate. The only time you're putting the dog in the crate is when you leave. Then you're leaving that opportunity for the dog to amp up. All right, so more crate time while you're home. Um, maybe after a walk. This is the other thing, guys. Very important. Make sure your dog is exercised before you ask the dog to be calm. Especially for a young dog. It's pretty unfair to ask a dog to be calm if they haven't had the opportunity to exercise. So exercise, very, very important. You'll see a big difference just by giving them exercise. You may not even have to, you may not even have to uh, really do some training if you get, if you give them that exercise because they will give up much quicker and be calm when they're properly exercised. So sometimes half the battle is getting up every day, taking your dog for a walk. Not just putting them in the backyard and just letting them run them up. I'm talking about mental stimulation. That's going to really tire them out as well. Mental stimulation. Thank you. The crate question was in follow-up of the anxiety question earlier, giving them a job instead of breeding too excitedly. Yeah, I hope that helps for you. Okay. Uh, my sister and I have dogs from the same litter. They don't live together, but see each other often. They're very well behaved when they aren't together. But when they are together, they are sassy, barking at nothing, uh, taking stuffing out of the comforter, anything we can do to help that. Um, so you're saying that they don't bark like that when they're alone? And they don't take stuffing out of the comforter, comforter when they're alone? All right, well, if that's the case, um, uh, then that's fine. When they are together, though, here's a great solution. When they are together, every 10 minutes, put a leash on them and let them settle down. Okay. Okay. Because it's very important that they can learn how to control their impulses while they're together. I'm working with three Beezos right now, and they have issues 
within the dynamics of them. So the female, I have the mother, I have a, I have a, the, a pup, and then I have the pup's mother and father. And so the female, they're all, they all have sort of um, attachment issues um, between each other. And so it's, it's important for me to uh, spend enough time with them alone, but also spend enough time with them together because they have a codependent relationship, which can be not healthy because they tend to forget everything else and show obsessive behaviors within each other. So, um, so just today... I put I had the mother and the father out at the same time. The mother does not allow the male uh, to do anything else to do anything without her. And as a matter of fact, I grabbed the leash and let the male um, go pee, go poop, and the female just sat there, looked at the dog, looked at the male, and whined the entire time. That's not healthy. You want to be able to have a a certain level of autonomy to where they don't seem codependent from each other okay and so when when your dogs are together every again right away the first thing that you should do is maybe control both of them so they can calm and then let them play and do whatever and then if their play or their behavior becomes something that you sense is out of control or obsessive that's when you wrangle them back in and give them another five minute break or until they lay down and or indifferent to the situation. Then you bring them again. What you have to do is help them gain the ability to control their impulses within the, within the dynamic of their relationship. Very important. Because some dogs get really sick if one dog dies or if one dog goes away. And you don't want to, you want to avoid that. Um, but that, that, that happens more so with dogs that live with each other and just do everything together. Okay, so contrary to what a lot of people think, you should spend individual time with all of your dogs as opposed to spending all the time with all dogs. All right, thanks for your question. Feel free to ask another. Y'all making me think tonight. Okay. Joe Biden is a child molester. Man, YouTube can get crazy. I'll ignore that. Okay, my dog attacks dogs that yelp at the dog park. He is silent without warning. He will not stop. <clears throat> it's very scary, and he does great otherwise. Should I stop taking him? Uh, no. You don't have to stop taking him, but what you have to do is intervene in that situation. Your dog's trying to be controlling of what he seems, what it seems to be something that's out of control. And so you will have to intervene somehow. The best way to do that is to have an e-collar because you can correct your dog from far away. Now, I'm not saying shock the hell out of the dog. Don't, don't, I'm never, ever saying that. But you have to give the dog the appropriate level of correction to where he wants to reconsider his actions. And, and then you don't have to even address it again. You know, sometimes it could just be a one-time fix. But the dog does need an intervention at the moment where it does want to get controlling. I've dealt with that with so many dogs. Um, and they just need a little bit of intervention. Uh, right at those moments so the dog can learn that it's not necessary to do. It doesn't have to do that. You don't have to be controlling. I'm in control of you. And then the dog learns, again, how to control that sort of impulsive behavior. But when it comes to impulsive behavior, there are other ways and other areas where you can help your dog learn how to control his impulses. It's not always about the same particular, that, that, that area it's not about that area where the dog struggles the most or where the dog is going to cause the most harm. Because I just trained a Rottweiler that was re resource aggressive. Okay, that was the area where it caused the most 
it could cause the most damage and harm. But we also learned that the dog was aggressive towards the vacuum, aggressive towards the broom, aggressive towards dogs who, like your dog, um, when another dog plays too rough or gets vocal, the dog wants to go over there and address it. And so you have, you have to evaluate how many other areas you can help the dog learn how to control itself and you will have to be controlling, but no behavior should go on uh, unchecked that is obsessive. If the dog feels like, if you feel like your dog is, cannot help but do these things, then it should be intervened, no matter what it is. It should get on your nerves and you should stop it because you're only helping the dog and you're making your life a little bit more convenient, to be honest. So it's not always about the, 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 the thing that, you know, the area that could cause the most harm. It could also be uh, many areas where, you know, that don't cause too much harm, but is still annoying. Okay, look for those, because then that area that really matters is going to be easier to deal with. I hope that answers your question. Okay, any recommendations for barking when other people enter our home? Uh, our German Shepherd mix knows to go to her spot when someone knocks, but once they enter our home, she barks constantly and looks uncomfortable. It will take 10 minutes or so for her to calm down. Um, so, so you have to have, if you're not already working with a training tool, you have to have a training tool um, to get the dog to go to her spot when someone knocks. All right, and so this is how you can help make it a little easier. Oh, make it a little easier for the dog to respond to you. But why don't you guys work on the knocking and you guys work on opening the door and then having her go back to her spot. But again, if the dog is constantly getting up, then that means your corrections aren't there or aren't enough. And you must then give the dog the appropriate level of correction to where the dog says, all right, got to listen to you. Despite what I want to do, despite what I feel like I need to do, I got to listen to you. All right, so that's that's the that's the challenge. And so um, if you have to add certain tools to get that, then that's what you have to do. But um, practice without, practice with just you and the dog. Make sure you're doing that. All right. Thanks for your question. Feel free to ask another one. Okay. Uh, but what happened to the Great Dane you were training? I think he came back to you last summer for aggression issues. It looked like he was being trained as a service dog. Oh, no, that's just, I've made him my, kind of my personal dog now. And so, um, he's just, Oakley is, you know, hanging out. He's my dog. I haven't made it official yet. I'll probably make it official soon. But, you're welcome. Okay, question for Brenda. I met a trainer that told us to only do short walks and keep our reactive dog at low threshold, but said we did not need to exercise him outside and could just do normal mental exercises to tire him out. Wasn't sure if we agreed with that, but curious to get your thoughts on that. Uh, let's see. I would say the dog's your the, the the priority is to get the dog to be to, to exercise. You cannot expect a dog to, to you can only expect a dog to listen to you to to a certain level if you haven't exercised the dog. The dog needs the exercise. It's a release of anxiety. It's going to be much better if you exercise the dog. Now how you go about exercising is, is one thing too, you know, uh, your trainer should have you, um, walk the dog loose leash by your side. That's, that's the most important thing. And, um, as far as the low threshold thing, I mean, I kind of agree with that. I mean, you know, if your dog's reactivity is that bad to where you have to avoid dogs, then you may have to avoid dogs. But the most important thing is, if you ever want to get over that, is that 
if it how well your dog listens to you on the walk okay your dog should be listening to you instead of listening to itself and there's ways to do that feel free to give me a call Brenda if you uh, need more help with that I will definitely give you my best advice um, because we go back all right thanks for your question uh, sorry again but I mean tools such as harnesses or clicker I, or I don't know what I don't know I don't know what you're talking about sorry again but I mean tools such as harnesses or clicker um, I'll just go ahead and tell you harnesses if you want your dog to pull then you can put a harness on your dog sure and a clicker is A clicker is a lame excuse for trying to get the dog to listen to a clicker than, than you. So, um, a clicker is good for trick training. If you want to train your dog to do tricks and you need to mark a certain behavior, then clicker is good. But what's to stop someone to, from going, you know, making a really weird noise quickly? I think the clicker is could be just something that you always you know it can be an inconvenience you can just say yes as a substitute for what the clicker is actually doing the clicker is to mark behavior right and so you want to mark your behavior you just say yes or good or, blah, or whatever whatever it may be um so i don't use a clicker and i definitely don't use harnesses only if i'm teaching a dog you know protection work or you know so that's that you're welcome <clears throat> Brianna says hey my dog is crazy that's it he's literally just crazy as in he may be missing a few screws yeah well he's a Belgian Malinois so there you go uh, feel free to reach out Maybe I can give you some tips, but I know you got I got. I know you have your handful with that boy. So I see it. So keep up the good work with what you're doing, though. I really admire your work. You're welcome. All right. I have a six-month-old German Shepherd, female. Uh, a one-year-old female. German Shepherd and an eight-month-old German Shepherd male. They're all el they're all altered. The younger two are rescued. The male can jump on the two females and take away their toys, no problem. But if the younger female tries to take anything with the older female, they will fight. The younger female has a lot of energy and is toy possessive. With the older female the younger the two younger dogs are in manners class yes we go for a two mile walk every day through a wooded area i still use the prong collar on their walks we live out in the country all right so what's your question if your question is how to get them to stop fighting then um Whoever's the instigator has to be punished for fighting. They can actually learn that it's not okay to fight. Um, but you'll have to pay attention to them while they're in that environment to in order to intervene. So when you have toys out, and toys shouldn't just be laying around all the time if you want to solve the problem. If you want to solve the problem, then you have to take some time out of your day, put the toys out, and then have the ability to um, correct the dog's behavior, uh, the one that's, again, giving you some problems. But um, Because you can teach a dog to share. So, that's that. If you're not around, don't put those toys out. That's just my opinion. All right, thanks for your question. Feel free to ask another one. Okay, let me get back to, all right. Whew. 
Y'all making me work today. Dog comes to work. Um, okay, this question is for Becky. Dog comes to work or other places outside the home with owner. Dog is fine with anyone who is already in a building slash property, but it's scared, fearful, aggressive towards anyone who comes in later than the dog. Why is the dog okay with others who are already on the property and not okay with those who come in? And how do you fix this? I mean, the dog is um, becoming just territorial of the property. And anybody who comes in is to that dog a stranger that she feels she needs to address and be protective of. How do you fix it? Why don't you go ahead and um, um, tie the dog up or something like that or keep a leash on the dog. And then when the dog gets fearful, you must tell the dog something to do. Okay? You must give that dog a job. Go lay down. You should not and cannot control this uh, situation. I'm in control. And then after that, everything will be fine, right? So like the first five minutes of people coming in, once the dog gets alert, that's your cue, your, your, um, that's your, uh, your sign that you should take control of the dog because the dog is all, the dog feels like um, it needs it needs to take control. So if you take control, then the dog won't. But the dog will also learn um, that it shouldn't act that certain way. Okay. Thanks for your question. Um, all right. This question is Chris's question. How is your podcast coming along with local veterinarian? Thank you for listening to you. Thank you. Listen to you every Wednesday. Thank you for your service to dog owners. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Um, how's that going? Uh, it's going, it's not going. I mean, it's going slow. <laughs> I've got to get some equipment and things like that yet. I got to, I got to set up. I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I want to do it at my home or thinking about renting out uh, an office to have my podcast um, there. And uh, so, so that's that. Okay, Angelica, you, re you asked another question. Should you always start with basic sit, stay, and come? How do you approach aggressive issues? You approach aggressive issues by making the dog sit, stay, and come, but with duration. Because if the dog can sit, stay, and come, I mean, and really sit, stay, and come, uh, despite what the dog is trying to get aggressive over, then the dog learns that it doesn't have to get aggressive. All right? Okay, Isaiah. What's up, brother? How are you, man? Um, he says, submissive peeing when you pet a male dog. Uh, well, I maybe take a break from petting the dog. Maybe pet the dog if the dog comes up to you. Don't go up to the dog and pet. Maybe the dog can't handle it. So if the dog wants to be pet and is ready for it, if the dog comes up to you and pets, and then you pet, um, that may eliminate it. Or, again, just take a break from it. Take a bre break from going up and, and, uh, and petting the dog. You know, maybe it needs a... Maybe it just can't handle that pressure at the moment. All right. Thanks for your question. Okay. Let me make sure I got all the questions. Yep. Got them there. Okay. All right, you guys, uh, I think that's it. Any last questions, you guys better, you know, put them in, type, in, type them in, do all that good stuff because uh, it is 8-12 and we had a good discussion. Uh, so, all right. I'm going to take a drink and if there's no questions, then we're going to sign off. Thank you.
All right, you guys. Uh, we're going to sign off. We'll be here next week. Thank you guys for tuning in uh, with me. We'll be here next week. Come with your questions or if someone you know needs some help, let them tune in because um, it's very important that these people know that there um, is help out there. There's plenty of dogs that are being put down because people don't know how to deal with aggression and fear or just a really hyper uh, dog, you know. So um, thank you guys for the love. Give me a thumbs up. Give me a heart. And for my YouTube people, thank you so much again. Um, I appreciate all of the, uh, the, the support. We'll see you guys next week. Oh, I see those questions on YouTube. I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get to them. Okay, hold on. Uh, all right. My dog attacks dogs that yell. Okay, we already addressed that. What? What? We'll get an e-collar. Thank you. Should I use the in-home? Should I use that in the in-home stranger aggression? Yeah, you can. But remember this: that the e-collar is only there to. Um, to proof what it already knows. So teach the dog without the e-collar and then proof it with the e-collar. You can't, you don't want to teach with the e-collar because it may just um, be too much, okay? And so very important. I've got e-collar videos um, on my YouTube channel. Make sure you um, teach the dog what you want the dog to do before you put that e-collar on. And then that's how you proof um, those commands. All right.